January 8th, 1.21pm, District Court, Defendant Lobby Number 1. Hey there everyone, this is Danielle. Let's finish off Recipe for Turnabout. A case which has made me uncomfortable multiple times. Uh, this is the last chapter, thankfully, and then we're on to probably the best cases in the trilogy, so... Heck yeah. Case 4, it, this game has 5 cases, case 4 is like a shorter one that leads into case 5, and then case 5 is amazing, so... <laughs> yeah, uh, this case is, is just a bit of a speed bump, but let's get it over with. <laughs> so we're finally gonna see the tiger on the stand. We've almost got this case 1 now, Nick. I wish I could agree. Huh? When I cross-examined Mr. Armstrong just now, he said he was just doing what the tiger told him to do. But Gotto picked up on it, remember? He pointed out that without proof, we don't know if what he testified is the truth. Well, something weird happened there. You mean, you think Mr. Armstrong was lying? I don't know, but if that's the line the prosecution takes, we could be in trouble. I get the feeling that we don't have the case-making evidence we're going to need. Hey, pal. Detective Gumshoe. What are you so jumpy about, Detective? Your hair's standing on end. Hey, that's the pot calling the kettle black, little Miss Topknot. It's not a Topknot. Never mind about the hair, I just calm down, alright? I, I I can't stand still when I don't have a job to do. I, I, I kind of got wound up. Ah, <laughs> No kidding. You gotta have something you need me to do, pal. Anything. Well, um... Hey, I'm gonna take a jog back down to the precinct. I could get some prints analysed for you if you've got an hour. An hour? The trial will have reconvened by then. But Nick, we still don't have a really decisive piece of evidence, right? True. Without some kind of trump card to pull out of the bag, we're really stuck. You said you could get some fingerprint analysis done in an hour? You bet. In that case, would you mind taking, checking the prints on this for me? I have never picked the wrong item here because I know it needs to be this one. Um... Eh, let's just go ahead. <laughs> if you're going back to the station anyway, could you find out whose prints are on this? Oh, hey, that's the small bottle I gave back to you this morning, right? Yeah. I think it's time we solve the last mystery of who the prints on it belong to. Sure thing, pal. Actually, that's been gnawing at me, t at me too. Small bottle given to Detective Gumshoe. Okay, I'll get this off to the lab right away. Just make sure you don't lose the case before I get back. This is pretty much the final showdown, I guess. It's time to separate the phonies from the real guys. Here we go. January 8th, 1.56pm, District Court, def courtroom number 4. I'm actually recording this back to back with the previous episode, which I don't usually do because these are kinda long and I have to talk a lot, so hopefully my voice holds out, we'll see how we go. Court will now reconvene. Mr. Gotto, did you find this Furio Tigre? I even tamed him for you. It was a three-cup job. No problem. T tamed him? The guy's name may be Furio Tigre, but come on. He's pretty lively. Be careful. He still bites. Very well. Please show Mr. Tigre to the stand. There he is. Um, witness. Please state your name and occupation for the- Ah! Don't hide under the table, Maya. Unless there's room for me down there, too. I, uh, um, would you mind what you say to me? N nothing I didn't say nothing honest. Who could have guessed the fear would induce a Brad Brooklyn accent in the judge? <laughs> I've got business to take care of, you hear me? So who the hell called me into this hole? I don't know what I'm doing with this voice, I'm trying. Was it you, Spikey? No, of course not. It was... the judge. <laughs> Your Honor? Oh dear, I, um, I seem to have dropped my pen. 
Where on earth is it? Don't mind me, just carry on with the proceedings as normal. <sighs> That's it, we're doomed. Maybe you just didn't hear me. I said, who the hell was it that called me in here? I'm going for kind of a Cockney accent, and that's not really what he's supposed to have, I think. <laughs> There's no need to shout. We can all hear you. What do you say? There's no point struggling. You're caught in a snare. The relentless snare of the law. And I'm the one that holds you in. Arr. Too cool. Don't let him get the better of you, Nick. Let's start with the basics. You know about the incident in question, correct? Incident? I don't know nothing about no stinking incident, mask boy. You mean, you didn't attend the previous trial of Maggie Bird? Maggie you? I got more important things to do than watch courtroom dramas. Uh, of course. Well, perhaps you'd give us your testimony then. Please tell us about what you did on the day of the murder. Hmm. Phoenix Wright. Hmm? You the one who set this up, didn't you? You's gonna regret the day you ruffled the tiger's fur. You hear what I'm saying? Maybe I should have brought a diaper with me today? Get a grip, Nick. Thanks, Maya. Under the table. <laughs> the tiger's alibi. I don't know nothing about no murder. I was tied up with business in December last year, spent all of my time in my office. I got whales lined up to borrow cash from tender lender every single day. You just want to check my alibi? Just ask Violetta. Ah, at last I found my pen. Very well then, Mr. Wright. Your cross-examination, please. Ah! What is it? Please, witness, if you could refrain from shouting out like that? I know the kind of games that guy in the blue plays. That lowlife ain't no lawyer. He just punches away at stupid details till he wins. L lowlife? Me? Listen up, smarty. Every time you ask me something that doesn't relate to this case, I'm gonna bill you $50,000. And you's gonna borrow the cash from me. Uh, that's one loan contract I refuse to sign. And don't think it ain't gonna hurt when you tangle with the tiger. Ha! I love a good spectator sport. J j just a minute. That's really not... This witness is... How can I put it? A hungry tiger roaming the urban jungle. Get on his bad side, and he'll bite everyone's heads off. Yours too. Very well. <laughs> I have no choice but to impose a penalty system here. You just better be listening. I said I've got business to take care of. Big business. If I don't split now, I ain't gonna catch my bus. The court will impose a penalty for any irrelevant pressing of witness testimony. Keep that in mind as you begin your cross-examination, Mr. Wright. Y yes Your Honor. You can do it, Nick. Come out from under there already, would you? Would you, Maya? Okay, so yeah, we can't press. Um, we don't really need to, uh, but we don't want to press, uh, all over the place. That will cause some problems. Um, I think we just present the calendar to this, because it says meet with the tiger on December 3rd. I'm just gonna chuck down a quick little save scum, just in case, because it's been a while. Uh, I'd forgotten how obnoxious parts of this case are. Cause wow, yeah, they are obnoxious. No, that that didn't help. It it it's a contradiction. Uh, I don't know why they're not accepting it because it it's a contradiction. Um, just think, all you have to do is pressing on something irrelevant, and bam, fifty thousand dollars. Get real, Maya. How about you pay back the money then? Your allowance should cover it. Hey, I'm no idiot, you know. Well, I'm certainly not the one who thought that the $50,000 was free money. Anyway, I need to work this guy without pressing his testimony too hard. But his testimony is pretty solid as it is. I admit nothing jumps out at me as a contradiction. But I've got to find an opening somewhere. Or I need to make one. Maybe I do need to press, I can't remember. Um... 
By Violetta, you're talking about the Cadeverini families? Yeah. You don't want to cross them, or you's gonna wind up sleeping with the fishes. Once the Godfather finds out you've been dragging Violetta through the mud, he'll do you in. Sorry, I I couldn't quite put it all together towards the end there. He said that just like Viola, didn't he? I get the feeling this might not be the right time to probe him about her. All right, I think we can press, but not necessarily press harder. Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, I, I remember. Okay, so we do need to press. Okay, I probably should have read that out, sorry. <laughs> Are you sure about that? We're talking about one month ago, you know? You see these teeth? That's how sharp my secretary is. Sharp? Is he talking about Viola Cadaverini? She writes everything in my scheduler. December, mainly in the office. That's what it says, so that's where I was. That seems like a rather... Uh, sketchy schedule. <sighs> there he goes again. Hmm. What the tiger did all December isn't the issue. What's important is what he was doing on the day of the murder. So, now what? I believe we have to press this one. Mr. Tigre, what use one? Uh... If you wouldn't mind going into a bit more detail... Objection. This is the dead end, Trite, and you know it. Remember the rules. Objection. No, it's essential that we establish the witness's alibi accurately. I agree. The victim was killed on December 3rd. Were you in the office that day, too? Maybe you aren't listening. Of course I was. I never set foot outside. I had meetings all day with a bunch of cats wanting to do business with me. I ain't never seen that young kid before. I do believe the witness's last statement was important. Um, Mr. Gotto, if you could please... Mr. Tigre, the court asked you to add that last statement to your testimony. Hmm. Don't let an animal beat you. Be a man, Your Honor, and ask him yourself. Uh, never saw that kid before. That kid who has a loan from you? Uh, do you have evidence of that loan? Uh... There we go. Mr. Tigre, you claim you didn't know Mr. Glenn Elg, but it appears that Mr. Elg knew you. What? Mr. Elg left this little note on his calendar. Meet with the tiger. And the date? December 3rd. D December 3rd? That's the day of the murder. So, Mr. Tigre, I submit that you did indeed know one, mis no, know one Mr. Glenn Elg, because on the very day of the incident, you met with him. <laughs> not bad. You's actually not bad. S sorry? I was just messing with you to see how good you were. Did you hear that, Nick? He said you're not bad. That's one compliment I can do without. Plus, he's lying through his teeth. Um, witness, please remember that you are under oath. Lies will not be tolerated. You just calling me a liar? Is that what you're doing? Row row. <laughs> Ruh row. Uh, okay, Scoobs. <laughs> so you're saying that your claim to have never seen that kid before is the truth? I said I'm dead serious. You'd better believe that's the truth. Ha. Huh. Then I'd say that gives me time to enjoy another cup of pure black magic. Who's giving him that coffee? That is, while you testify for the court again, Mr. Tigre. Oh, yes, um, would you mind indulging the court witness? He never actually met the victim. That's got to be a lie right there. It's time I nailed this guy. <laughs> okay. If you, if, did, you do you, I guess. Uh, the victim, Glen Elg. I ain't no liar. I never met Glen Elg. There was some lame guy with that name. That w there was some lame guy with that name, though. Wanted to borrow cash from me. I set up a meeting with the guy at my office, Tender Lender. I waited around for him, but he ain't never showed. I ain't never, I ain't never even been to this Trey Beyond joint. You see it? I see. That all seems perfectly logical. 
You had arranged to meet with the victim, but he didn't show up. I've heard it's pretty hard to keep appointments when you're dead. Very well. You may begin your cross-examination, Mr. Wright. Yes, Your Honor. Didn't I tell you I got a big deal going down today? I ain't gonna make my bus now. I'm gonna have to take the express train. That bill's going straight to you, right? Grrr. Okay, this one is super simple. We already have evidence that uh, they have been to Trey Beyon. If we flip up to the end here. I mean, I have no idea why they kept these matches from Trey Beyon if they wanted to claim they'd ever been there, but they did. <laughs> Mr. Tigre, is there something you'd like to tell the court about these matches? Matches? What are you talking about? We found them in your office at Tender Lender. They're from that restaurant. What? If you've really never been to Trey Beyond before, what was the book of the restaurant's matches doing in your desk? He's been snooping around in my stuff, stuff now too, wise guy? What are you, my ball and chain? Ain't no broad controlling me. Gross. I mean, he's the villain, so I, I get why they're doing this, but ugh. Order, order. Well, witness? I think it's time you started telling us the truth, don't you? Rawr. Sorry, I'm terribly sorry, forgive me. I ain't no pussycat, I don't go back on what I said. But, okay. <laughs> I'm not going to go back on what I said, but I will. <laughs> but okay, I was at the joint that day. What? But listen good, alright? I might have been there, but I still never met that kid. Well, well. Looks like an order just came in for another testimony. I'm this close to proving it was him. He did meet Glen Elk that day, and he did put poison in his coffee. He must have. At Trebion. I was supposed to meet with the kid at the restaurant that afternoon. When I opened the door to the joint, I saw one ugly scene. The guy was laid out over the table, stiff as concrete. I figured if the place wasn't hot already, it was gonna be, so I split. I heard the cops, cops' sirens on my way out, and I went straight back to my office. Hmm. I see. You didn't actually meet with him in the end, then. Well, Mr. Wright, your cross-examination, please. Yes, Your Honor. Hold it. If I wait around here any longer, I ain't even gonna make the normal express. No more stupid questions. Ha. Huh. No problem. Anytime Trite presses you on something irrelevant, I'll see he pays a penalty. M Mr. Goddo, that's my job. Your job is to slam that little hammer of yours and call a guilty verdict. <laughs> so do it. I yes, sir. The special express ain't cheap, right? Just so as you know, since you's paying. Oh man, doesn't the rule of law mean anything around here? Okay, um, I think we need to press again, but we have to avoid pressing irrelevant things. It's the same as the first testimony, where you can press harder, I think. You mean you saw Glen Elg's dead body? I guess I did, but I only saw him from behind. He was wearing some raggy bit of cloth he called a hat. And what time was this? I don't know. Huh? You know what winds me up more than anything else in the world? Watches. Round watches. I ain't gonna pollute my paws with some tickin' henpecker. Out of interest, Mr. T. Great, what winds you up the second most? Huh? What do you think? Square watches. <laughs> Is this guy for real? <laughs> Look, all I needed to know was that something bad was going down in that place. So the meeting wasn't due to take place at Tenderlender at all then? The kid was making a fuss about coming into the office. It's always that way when I want to talk about repayments. Even though I got the best punching bag you've ever seen, if there are any issues. 
Maybe it's because of the punching bag that people are scared to come? So that's why you decided to meet at Trey Beyond? Ha. Huh. You're going over old ground again, Trey. Sorry. You just earned yourself a penalty, now suck it down. You will suck down the penalty, Mr. Wright, and you will like it. Okay, I wasn't allowed to press on that, apparently. Thank you, sir, may I have another? <sighs> okay, whatever. That wasn't old ground, that was like verifying that the guy wasn't lying in his previous testimony. <sighs> An ugly scene? What do you mean? The witness has already told us, Trite, which makes that question irrelevant. No, it doesn't. But, but... Okay, so you can't press at all, or else you just get pen penalised. I'll limit myself to 17 cups of coffee during a trial. That's the rule. You better limit the number of times you take a penalty, Trite. Or your guts will look like the inside of a chimney. Ashen. Don't make me burn you again, Mr. Wright. I guess I shouldn't have pressed him on that. The fuck? <laughs> Guess I'm gonna make that special express after all. So, to recap, this ugly scene you saw was... That's the same question I just asked! <sighs> I'm really frustrated, <laughs> I don't know if you can tell. <laughs> um... I think it's this one, like the timing maybe? You went straight back? Did a bout of guilt suddenly hit you for what you did? What, you, what are you trying to say? You trying to tell me yous ain't never been guilty of nothing? Um... We all have our crosses to bear. We all have to swallow the dark secrets we hide. Like this. The courtroom's not exactly the place to talk about dark secrets, is it? It seems you've done it again, Mr. Wright. Another... well... <sighs> I hate this. I can't- I can't remember what you're supposed to do, and, uh, I must impose a penalty accordingly. That was a reasonable question! Well, Nick, what do you think? He's running out of ways to avoid the truth. I need to press him fast before he has time to think things through. I've got to come right back at him with a contradiction. Be careful what you press him on, though. Or you'll get penalised, okay? Uh, do I need to press this one? It's the only one I haven't pressed yet, and there's no obvious contradictions for the evidence. So you didn't actually set foot inside the restaurant, then? The tiger is a busy cat. I don't hang around for no one. I ain't got time to be caught up in no murder investigation. So, when exactly did you pick up the matches? There were matches just inside the front door. Our detective friend wound up in trouble with the, ch with the, ch with the chef after taking five books home. Poor Gumshoe. It's almost enough to make a man cry. What am I supposed to press on? Um. Oh, right. I'm supposed to present this evidence, because if you look at the way the place is arranged, from the front door you cannot see the victim's seat. <sighs> well, I'm frustrated. You're something of a loan-collecting pro, aren't you, Mr. Tigre? No one escapes the tiger's clutches. Well, I'm something of a lie-detecting pro. And no one escapes the phoenix's clutches. I think it's time we got something straight. What's this, Trite? A new line of irrelevant questioning? These are the floor plans of the crime scene. You say you were standing at the entrance, Mr. Tigre. From there, your field of vision would have covered area something like... this. Indeed, the witness would have had a clear view of the victim's seat. Isn't that what I just said? I saw the back of the kid's head. Unfortunately for you, that is not possible. If the court would think back, you'll remember that between each of the tables is a tall partition. Why, that's true! Now look at the plans again, the truth is painfully obvious. From the entrance, the field of vision of any customer walking in ends here.
So, from the entrance of Trey Beyond, you couldn't have seen the victim's seat. But you did see the victim that day, because you met with him. Objection. Wrong. Have you forgotten the old man's testimony yesterday? The victim was alone at his table. But the defence just proved that point to be moot. The victim witnessed by Mr. Kudo was not Glen Elg, but a fake. What? In order to have Mr. Kudo falsely testify, the real killer posed as the victim he had just killed and acted out a charade. That will do. This trial has gone on long enough without the obvious question being answered. Who exactly was this real killer who impersonated the victim? You say the killer murdered Glen Elg, and then impersonated his victim in a performance for Victor Kudo? In that case, Mr. Wright, reveal the identity of this criminal to the cause. Why is criminal in scare quotes? Like, murdering someone is a crime. <laughs> Obviously, the killer is Furio Tigre. No one else could have done it. What? Well, witness? <laughs> now that's cute. You think you can pin this on the tiger? Maybe you don't understand. The tiger is king of the jungle. So I dares you to say it again. Come on, you got the guts? Y y you can't threaten me, Mr. Tiger. Tiger Tigre. It's the defense. Go ahead and tell the witness, Mr. Wright. Mr. Wright! Sounds to me like it must be you, old man. You's got guts, I'll give you that. M Mr. Wright, do not leave me to handle this alone. Ha. Ah. Perhaps I can end this embarrassment. M Mr. Gotto? Let's just go back over Mr. Kudo's testimony one more time. The old man didn't see just the victim. Oh, no, no, no. The starving girl brought him a Javachino, but she put something in it. There's no question about it, she very conspicuously put some white powder in there. Was the victim he saw the real victim or not? That doesn't matter. The fact remains, he saw the accused put the poison into the coffee. Yes, it was the waitress who poisoned the coffee. Very impressive, Mr. Gotto. Waiting for my absence to launch your attack. Huh. Found your pen at last, trite? It was in my pocket. <laughs> but anyway, Mr. Kudo witnessed two people that day. He saw the victim, the supposed Mr. Glen Elg, and the waitress from behind. Yes, your point, Mr. Wright? I think the conclusion is obvious. If this Glen Elg was really the killer in disguise, then surely it's possible the waitress was also part of the show. What? You mean the waitress was an imposter as well? The defendant, Ms. Bird, fell unconscious immediately after the incident. And someone used her fainting to hatch an elaborate plan to pin the murder on her. Who on earth was it? Who was this waitress that Mr. Kudo witnessed? It's probably pretty obvious at this point. It's Viola Cadaverini. Who is this woman? Her name is Viola Cadaverini. She's an employee of Tenderlenda. You's making a big mistake. Do you know who Violetta's grandfather is? You better be going home in an armored truck tonight if you know what I mean. Stop shaking, Nick. W where was I? Yes, the defendant, Ms. Bird, has stated the following. Well, when I took the coffee over to the victim's table, it's true there was another customer in the restaurant. Um, she was sort of creepy, and she had a kind of cackling laugh. <laughs> there are just too many contradictions in this case. The second man at the victim's table who nobody but Miss Bird seems to have seen. The earpiece worn by the victim in his left ear when that eardrum was ruptured. And the radio show he was supposedly listening to half an hour after it was over. There is only one logical explanation that clears up all of these contradictions. The whole incident took place twice, once for real and once for show. I think you already said this, Phoenix. 
and Mr. Furio T. Gray, the only person who could have committed the crime is you. Witness, what have you got to say? That's cute. S sorry? You're all right. I could do with a guy like you around. What do you mean? Okay, I'm in on this game. I'm gonna have to charter a jet to get to my, get me to my meeting now, but I'm gonna give you one more thing to think about before I go. Something to think about? You've got it all wrapped up nice, huh, right? But you've missed out on one real important thing. But that can't be. I was in the joint that day, and I met that kid too. But I couldn't have poisoned him, you see it? What? Do you really expect us to believe you now, Mr. Tigre? Huh. What a troublemaker. T troublemaker? Looks like we're gonna need another one for the road. One more steaming cup of hot testimony. Indeed. Witness, you will explain yourself to the court. I will give you one more chance to testify. What happened that day at Trey Beyond between yourself and the victim? Ties to the victim. Yeah, I loaned El Cash, about a hundred thousand dollars. That day, we was, due, we was due to have a little chat. That kid had his payback date, see? So anyway, he tells me he's got no way to pay up. I'm about to flatten the guy when he starts screaming. Yes, I won! Half a million bucks! He got lucky, you know? Real lucky. If that waitress hadn't known what she'd done, everything would have been over. Now, I see that the principal amount you loaned Mr. Elg was $50,000. Yeah, well, he's got the VIG to take into account. Interest builds up fast, you know? That's faster than fast. $100,000 is twice his principal. And the repayment deadline was December 3rd, the day of the incident in question. Yeah, he was one lucky kid. He got that half a million just in time. So I ain't have, have no reason to kill the kid. And if I ain't got no motive, you ain't got no case. His motive. Hmm, he has to have one, but what is it? Okay, so obviously he could have been paid that half a million dollars, but... I think I need to press here. Um... Because you see, the thing is, he wants more money than that. And if he takes MC Bomber from Glenn, he gets more money than that. He needs more money so he can pay this off. I think I need to press again, but I'm reluctant because I know that it could give me a penalty for no good reason. The waitress, you mean... The girl with the glasses in the defendant's chair. Who else could I mean? If she hadn't gotten in the way, things would have been bada bing, bada boom, over and done with. Maybe I should push a little on- I'll push a little on this. How things would have been. What do you mean things would have been over and done with? Are you all there or what? I'm talking about the cash. I was there to get my hundred thousand bucks back, that's all. I'm a businessman. It was all coming together before that waitress got in the way. Hmm. As far as I can tell from the witness's testimony, other than recoup recouping his loan, Mr. T. Gray had no motive for killing the victim. Witness, you will amend your testimony to reflect what you just said. The tiger's motive, huh? Uh, I think I just present MC Bomber as the answer to this one. Yes. So you just intended to get back the hundred thousand dollars Mr. Elk owed you, correct? I loaned the guy the cash, so that's my right. Unfortunately for Mr. L, I don't believe the hundred thousand dollars is what you were really after. Objection. What are you getting at, Trite? What else would a moneylender be after other than money? Oh, the moneylender was after money, but money in a totally different league. The kind of money that a single disc like this would fetch. What is that? A computer virus, Your Honor. A virus called MC Bomber. A computer virus? What does one of those do? 
A computer virus is a program that wreaks havoc on the insides of a computer. A computer? What does one of those do? I guess the beard isn't the only part of his honour that is from the Stone Age. I'll explain it to you later, Your Honour. Right now, this is the important part. A virus like MC Bomber would be worth several million dollars on the black market. S several million dollars? Lending money with no hope of ever seeing repayment would normally be bad for business. But in this case, the very fact that Glen Elg had no way to repay the money is crucial. What? Glen Elg was a programmer, a highly skilled programmer. That skill was the collateral Mr. Elg put up in order to borrow the money. Objection. You're trying to suggest the witness's motive was to get hold of that program? Exactly. The witness may have poor fashion sense, but he is by no means an idiot, Trite. A man like him could get his hands on one million dollars without resorting to murder. Of course he could, provided that he had time. But what if he had needed the money right then? When the pressure's on, the luxury of choice tends to disappear. It seems to have a logical conclusion for this theory, Mr. Wright. Would you care to share it with us? Why did Mr. Tigre need money to the tune of one million dollars? I mean, this is the first time we've mentioned one million dollars, but this is why. It's because of Viola's medical bill. <laughs> In December of last year, you found yourself in need of a huge amount of money. About six months ago, you were involved in a traffic accident, weren't you? An accident involving a car and a scooter in which a young woman was injured. She was taken to the hospital, where she underwent surgery. But how much of this do you know? These, medicinal pa these medical papers document the treatment of the young woman in question. According to these, her operation cost one million dollars. And yet, when the payment was due last month, you somehow managed to pay it in full. One million dollars? A preposterous sum! Someone should sue these HMOs. So, wait... Did... Did he not sell the first, like, the copy of MC Bomber that he had? Like, because the disc was still in his office. But he must have sold MC Bomber, because otherwise he wouldn't have the money. So did he just make a copy of it and sell that, or...? Maybe he just sold it online, that would make a lot of sense. <laughs> huh. No one would pay a bill like that. The medical association got wind of it, the hospital went end up dead as a morgue. But Mr. Tigre had no choice but to pay, because his very life depended on it. Rawr. Uh, order! 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 You say his life depended on it, Mr. Wright? Indeed it did, simply because the injured woman was none other than Viola Cadaverini. Did you say... Cadaverini? Uh, I did, but I already mentioned her name before. Bruto Cadaverini, mob boss in charge of all underworld activities in the city, and... doting grandfather to his precious Violetta, also known as Viola Cadaverini. Wow. Your life was in danger unless you paid compensation to the boss, correct? It makes sense. You were desperate to acquire the one million dollars Bruto Cadaverini demanded of you. So desperate, in fact, you decided to sacrifice Glen Elg's life to pay your debt. On the day of the murder, Mr. Tigre's sole intention was to get his hands on this CD. Glen Elg had no way of paying back the $100,000, and Mr. Tigre knew it. But, then a miracle happened. The kind that Mr. Tigre would prefer to say never happened. But he can't, and neither can I. The lottery win? Exactly! At the 11th hour, Mr. Elg won half a million dollars in the lottery, which left Mr. Tigre with no way of getting his hands on the all-important CD. At least, no legitimate way. so he resorted to illegitimate means. That's crazy. He murdered Glenn Elg and then made his next move, to frame Maggie Bird for the crime. Mr. Tigre posed as Glenn Elg, while v Viola Cadaverini played the role of Ms. Bird. And then they reenacted the whole thing in order to establish a witness. 
the witness being the one we all heard testify yesterday, Mr. Victor Kudo. Objection. Like I said, Trite, that's crazy. No one could pull off a stunt like that. For starters, there's no way the chef could have been kept in the dark about it. Objection. Mr. Armstrong was in on it from the very beginning. Have you forgotten already, Mr. Gotto? Mr. Armstrong owed the witness money too, half a million dollars in fact. He had no choice but to go along with Mr. Tigray's plan. Order, order, silence, or I will clear the courtroom. <laughs> you've put on a good show, Spikey. If you want to stay alive in the loan shark business, you gotta be careful. You saying I dressed up like that kid, created a witness, and framed someone? If I did something crazy like that, I'd leave a trail as bright as my shirt. I ain't dumb enough to do something sloppy like that. I agree. Y you do? Despite your appearance, you were very careful. That's why you took one more precaution. One more trick to make sure Ms. Bird had no way out. What? Another one, Mr. Wright? Interesting. Why don't you fill us all in, Trite? What was this trick you say Mr. Tigray performed to frame the accused? It's this one. What on earth is that? What an insult- what an insult to think that anyone could be fooled by such a childish imitation. Consider yourself insulted, Your Honor. Mr. Tigre, you didn't just pose as the victim on the day in question. A month ago, in this very court, you posed as me. What? That's... that's... the truth. But... the witness looks nothing like you, Mr. Wright. Although, now that I think about it, it was you, wasn't it? No doubt, no doubt it was you, standing in here, this very court, a mere month ago. The Phoenix Ride who put up the most disreputable, shabby defense I had ever seen. Can you prove that, Gramps? Prove the attorney who represented the accused here a month ago was this man? Are you prepared to take the stand and testify that it was him? <laughs> hmm. Hey. Forget about it, yeah? I wouldn't do something like that. Not me. You... you made a mistake, right? It was someone else, huh? Have you no pride, sir? <laughs> This isn't a matter of pride. In case you didn't know, Trite, here in court we deal with people's lives. <sighs> Mr. Goddo is right. Your Honor? Speaking for myself, I am absolutely convinced. The attorney in question was the witness standing before me now. However, I preside over this court as the judge, with the vested power to hand down a verdict. Someone in my position cannot be swayed by a memory without evidence to support it. No! Couldn't they question the prosecutor who was there? You know, Winston? Because he was there. If the defense has no further evidence, the court will now excuse the witness. The circumstances surrounding Mr. Tigre are dubious for sure, but not conclusive. But we've come so far! You say he impersonated Glen Elg. You say he impersonated you. But none of that adds up to a murder charge. You don't have a shred of evidence that the witness poisoned the victim's coffee. Nargh! Ha! Sucks to be you, right? Don't mess with the tiger, or you're gonna get mauled. You's got that? All we managed to do here was chase him around a bit. But I was so close to getting to admit his own guilt. Ha. Huh. Looks like I won't be needing a refill. If I just have one more piece of evidence. One more piece of evidence and maybe I could get Maggie off the hook. This witness's cross-examination is over. You are free to go, Mr. Tigray. Your Honor, sir. 
Wait. Detective. Detective Gumshoe. Sorry I took so long, pal. I, I, I staked everything on this. My badge, the works. So here it is. My heart's counting on this too. What is it, Detective? Isn't it obvious, pal? It's the final, decisive piece of evidence. Wh what? January 8th, 2.48pm, District Court, Defendant Lobby Number 1. Sorry it took so long, pal, but I finally got the results from the lab. The results? About the prince, pal, from this medicine bottle. Oh, so, do you know who the prince belonged to now? Do you think I'm some kind of hack detective? Of course I know. So, tell us. They're the tigers, right? I knew it. <laughs> you bet. Clear as crystal, all over the bottle. They're Furio Tigre's paw prints, all right. That's great, we've got him now, Nick. What's wrong with you? You've hardly said a word since Detective Gumshoe got here. He's laid everything on the line for this, Nick. I know. Look, I'm sorry. This is kind of hard to say, but... It really doesn't make any difference who's prints are on that bottle now. Huh? What? Why not? What we need to produce at this stage in the trial is irrefutable evidence that the tiger put poison in Glen Elk's coffee. He's already admitted that he met the victim. The fact that his prints are on this bottle, that really doesn't make any difference now. I knew it. Great, no matter how hard I try, I'm never of any use. Hey, don't be so hard on yourself. This was our last chance to help Maggie, and I've been working on some useless piece of evidence the whole time. It's alright, I'm a real loser. It's not breaking news to me, pal. Um... Detective... Gumshoe? M Maggie! You've been working on something... for me? Sorry I let you down, Maggie. I know you didn't do it. And... I'm a detective. We're supposed to be able to prove stuff like that. I'm really sorry. I'll get out of your hair now. Detective Gumshoe, wait! He's gone. Isn't there anything we can do now, Nick? I wish there was. Gumshi worked so hard to get that evidence. If only there was some way I could use it. Small bottle, put it into pocket. January 8th, 3.04pm, District Court, courtroom number 4. Are we ready to use that evidence? <laughs> Mr. Wright. Yes, Your Honor. I granted you a recess so you could prepare this decisive evidence you've discovered. Um, yes. Don't keep us all in suspense, right? Show us. Naturally. We can assume it's evidence that will actually stand up in court, can't we? Think, Phoenix. Don't let Gumshoe's hard work go to waste. How much more of my time are you gonna waste? I ain't been in a court before. But you lawyers sure know how to blow things out of proportion. No doubt, given the nature of the evidence, it will speak for itself. Nevertheless, you will talk us through it, Mr. Wright. Well, I know I can't prove anything new with this evidence. I'm really backed into a corner here. But maybe if he thinks he's got me beat, he'll let his guard down a bit. Don't keep us waiting any longer, Mr. Wright. Present this final decisive piece of evidence to the court. This is the defense's final piece of evidence. Isn't that the victim's... Your Honor. Naturally, the court is already aware of the contents of this bottle. However, interesting new information has come to light. We have clearly identified some fingerprints on it. Fingerprints belonging to you, Mr. T. Gray. But, Mr. Wright, what conclusion are you hoping to draw from this new information? Everyone in here knows what this bottle contains. Except one man. One person in this courtroom should theoretically be in the dark. My prints are on that pansy-looking bottle? Is that what you're saying? Well, what the hell's in it anyway? A phony trial, a phony lawyer, and phony clues. Everything about this case has been phony. Seems like the perfect excuse for some phony evidence. 
Mr. Tigray, this is the decisive piece of evidence that will prove your guilt. Why? Because it contains... Potassium cyanide. This bottle contains... Potassium cyanide. Potassium cyanide? The poison used to murder Mr. Elg, Your Honor. The victim's killer used this very bottle. And on this bottle, Mr. Tigray, we found your fingerprints. Well, how do you explain that? <laughs> You'd make a good clown, you know that? What? You ain't never gonna get this to stick. You're just making me laugh now. You'd think a cheap bluff like, that's gonna fool the tiger? A bluff? I can see straight through you, Phoenix, right? That ain't the bottle with the cyanide in it. No, no, this is the bottle we found traces of the poison in. Don't mess with the tiger, or you're gonna get ripped to shreds. The cyanide bottle was brown, and it was made of glass. That cheap piece of trash? Don't look nothing like it. Got him. At last. W what? Why is everyone gone quiet? I said that bottle. Is this the bottle you're referring to? Yeah, that's it. That's the bottle the cyanide was in. But you ain't gonna find my prints on that bottle. Don't let that cozy looking suit fool you, peop fool you people. That lawyer's just playing games. Tell him, Mr. Prosecutor. Tell that guy where to go. You still haven't figured it out? Don't you realize what you just said? What I said? What's that, what did I just say? You were summoned to this court for the first time earlier today. If you really had nothing to do with the murder, you shouldn't have known all the little details. For instance, you shouldn't have known what kind of bottle the potassium cyanide was in. Uh, uh. But just now, you slipped up in front of every single person in this courtroom. You described the exact bottle used by the killer to hold the poison. Uh, um, you just don't know who you're messing with. I'm the tiger. I control millions of dollars on the black market. You just think I'm gonna, just, I'm gonna let some jumped up suit get the better of me? Sure, the last piece of evidence was phony. But that's just what you deserve. The phony trial with a phony lawyer it was all played out by you, the biggest phony of all. <laughs> What's going on? It looks like a blackout. Well done, trite. I saved my 17th cup of coffee just for you. Savor it. While you watch the police restrain your, your prey. Mr. Wright, you caught a tiger by his toe, but if this one hollers, he won't be let go. Is that an appropriate thing to say in a murder trial? <laughs> now then, how are things going with Mr. Tigray, Mr. Gotto? He is being arrested on suspicion of the murder of Glen Elg, Your Honor. Fortunately for us, we managed to rectify a very grave error. Miss Berg was found guilty in the absence of a genuine defense attorney. Yes, she was. And in the absence of genuine evidence, but the tiger made one mistake. Indeed. He very nearly got away with everything if it wasn't for that one slip of the tongue. Furio Tigre is a truly frightening criminal. Huh. The truly frightening one is that defense attorney over there. Gotto. Well, I'm now in a position to deliver my verdict. This court finds the defendant, Maggie Bird, not 
guilty. Yeah. Oh, thank goodness. That is all. This court is adjourned. January 8th, 4.10pm, District Court, Defendant Lobby, Number 1. Mr. Wright, I... 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 I'm at a loss for words. Thank you, sir. Congratulations, Maggie. I was so mad when Mr. Wright landed me in all that trouble a month ago. But now I feel like I can forgive him. Hey, that wasn't me, Maggie. That was the tiger. Look, Nick, in the doorway. Detective Gumshoe. Oh, uh, I guess I'll be heading off then. See you around, pal. Wait! Detective Gumshoe. Uh, oh, yeah. Congratulations, Maggie. Uh, thanks. Uh, I knew you were innocent all along. Why didn't you say that in your testimony, then? Huh? Oh. Well, I was... Well, guess I'll be heading off, then. See you around. Wait up, detective. He just ran off. Maggie, why are you being so hard on him? He busted his butt for you. It's thanks to him that we got the medication bottle. That wasn't even of any use. But... It's only because Mr. Wright used it so cleverly. Cleverly. Detective Gumshoe was just running around in circles. Poor guy. Looks like she still isn't ready to forgive him. Can't you put in a good word for him, Nick? Yeah, Maya is right. I should help Gumshoe out. It's clear he needs it. Uh, Maggie? You know, Detective Gumshoe's been really worried about you through all of this. I wanted to believe that, sir. But on that first day of the trial... He practically gave the judge a free pass to lock me up. He didn't have any choice, Maggie. He's a detective. He has to report the facts. He doubted me, that's why. He thought I might have done it. I've got to prove to her that Gumshoe really cares about her. I know. I'll give her a little present to celebrate her freedom. Yeah, that's that. this is the reason we're given a second lunchbox, so we can give it to an owl. Here you are. A present to celebrate your freedom. That's a present from Detective Gumshoe, made with a ton of love. He said you lost weight and he was worried about you. D Detective Gumshoe? I... I actually really like weenies, you know? Did you guys hear that? I'm pretty hungry myself, you know? Yeah, the trial dragged on a bit today, didn't it? Um... Is it okay if I eat this now? Oh. So, how is it, Maggie? It's... It's really good. No. Oh. Cuties. So the case of Phony vs. Genuine comes to an end. The false allegations surrounding Maggie have all been cleared up. And who knows, maybe a whole new chapter of her life is about to start. The end. So that's the recipe for Turnabout. Next up, Turnabout Beginnings. This one's kind of short, I think it's just two chapters. Uh, and then the final case, which is enormous and fantastic. So, look forward to these. Um, like I mentioned, I think at the start of this video, or the one before, uh, Turnabout Beginnings sort of leads into the last case, like, they're related, so... You'll see, you'll see. Um, but for now, thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed. Next time, we start Case 4, Turnabout Beginnings. Bye!